That's the real power of NLP. Make somebody feel good. When they see you again, they go, well, hi, how are you doing? Now imagine how effective in therapy that is. Because when your client comes to see you, what do they do? Nice physical anchor. I've got friends who are psychotherapists. They'll make the client cry for an hour. <laughs> Re-traumatizing them. Asking them about how bad the experience was that created the state in the first place. And they go, well, oh, 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 we'll see what we can do in the next session. Oh, I hope you're all right. Bang. They take the peak of a bad experience and then anger it with a handshake. And then the client comes in feeling quite good. Oh, I've had quite a good week this week. How are you doing? Bang. Oh, I don't know. When I come in, I feel shit. I wonder why. Be careful when you put anchors in. We're putting them into people whenever we meet them. They'll be at the peak of the state, good or bad, and you'll fire off that anchor unknowingly. Yeah. Many therapists do this. Be aware of the effect you're having on someone, sensory acuity, then put the anger in when they're feeling good. It doesn't have to be a physical anger. You can do that. Yeah? Or how are you doing? Whoa, nice to see you. Or even a change in voice. An intonation. It's and that increases there. It's mm. not comedians you like. Bad? That's mm. not a good state to be in. Stress causes cancer, stress causes illness and disease. So you're walking around and like with that wanker out there to make you feel bad and thereby yeah. end up with a medical condition. It's not good. You'd rather just see them, wouldn't you, and go, ah. <laughs> yeah? And feel good. And then they go, bastard. <laughs> and then they feel bad. You go, yeah, double that feeling. <laughs> Make them feel bad for no good reason. See, because obviously you're, you, you're reversing the anchor. Yeah. Yeah. So over the lunchtime, think, one or two of you, well, probably all of you, think of something you fucking hate or really winds you up and you want to get rid of that feeling. And I'll do that for you this afternoon. Well, we won't, but we'll teach you how to get rid of it. Yeah. Well, I'll do it to yeah. someone as a demonstration, so. Uh, yeah. Crap on. Yeah. <laughs> you're volunteering for not me. Yes. Not me. Yeah. I'll do the lot of you. Yeah. Right? I'll do you all at once. You can actually do oh, that. You can do that. You can do that. You can do that. Who oh. dares wins, man? You yeah. can do a whole room. Why not? It's an LP. If you've unpicked somebody when they've been in a particularly bad state by shaking your hands, yeah. which I have to do when I meet clients, yeah. how can you change that? Because obviously they're associating with me. Yeah. If can I ask you why why they're in a bad state when they come to you? Well, they've probably had a crap day with people not turning up for work and then right. they've got the feed. Okay. There'll be any number of reasons. Right. So before you I do anything, right, the first thing you must do then is build rapport and get them to access good state. When I first started doing an art, I'll quickly go through this because time's at a premium, but it is important to the whole teaching process. When I first got involved in, our, in NLP, yeah, my wife at the time, because I'm divorced now, yeah, but we don't want to go back. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't want to go back, it's fine actually. Yeah. We were seeing an eating disorders client, a girl who was in a terrible state. Yeah, cut her arms, actually started cutting her stomach because obviously they could see her arms so she cut her stomach. So she was in self-harm big time and she weighed about four and a half stone when she should have weighed about nine and a half to ten. Um, my wife said, look, she's a really difficult client to work with. She, can she said, this is my wife, she said, and don't think you can get her access a good time. She said she's not in a good place. She's been raped, abused, blah, 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 blah. So I'm thinking, thanks for all that information. <laughs> oh, now I feel great. So the girl walked in, Diane came in with her, because I said, come in with her, because she knows you, she doesn't know me. I sat down with the girl, and um, obviously she wanted to talk about the illness, the problem, which is the traditional way. Let's talk about the problem first. No, that's not the way I work. It's not the way NLP works. I said, right, uh, Kathy, um, I know you've, you've got this disorder and so on, you've, you're self-harming and so on. I've got the information on that, but that's, that's secondary. I said, um, can you ever think of a time when you felt good about your life at all? And she goes, oh no, absolutely not. I said, so you never had a good time? I said, have you ever worked for a living? She goes, oh, oh yeah. She said, I did. She said, um, I was working selling bathrooms. And I went, oh, tell us about that. And like, my wife's looking at me like, what's that bathrooms for? This is a serious, serious situation. I said, what's, what's, what did you do? I said, I've never met anybody who sold bathrooms. She said, oh no, she said, I work for a company just out in Albury. She said, uh, she said, I really loved it. See how she's starting to access a good memory. I'm not sitting there and see what you see, hear what you hear, feel what you feel, ooh, 
Yeah, I don't have to do that. You just have a conversation. So I said, so, were you good at it? She goes, that was brilliant. She said, I really loved it. She said, uh, she said, I sold more bathrooms in one week than one of the managers had sold in a year. She said, people just seem to like me. And I said, oh, right. I said, when you think about that particular time, then you, you enjoyed it. She goes, that was fantastic. And I said, brilliant. I said, can you go and get us a cup of tea, please? <laughs> I'm get rid of my wife. I'm going to work with this girl. And that's how we started. So her first impression of me was, oh, this is the bloke who got me feeling good. So when I saw her again, guess what? Oh, hiya, Bob. How are you doing? I said, how are you doing? Oh, great. She said, that exercise you gave me was brilliant. She said, she had this tree, which was an anchor that she used to like to sit under. And when she was having a bad time, she'd go and sit under the tree. And then we'd work on accessing, there was another anchor for her. Because guess what? She started going out to walk a dog past that very tree. Bang, feel good. Now, I'm not saying she's gonna feel good all of the time because nobody does that. Shit happens. But if you're in a relatively good state anyway, guess what? You'll deal with the bad times. I mean, I could go out of here and find out the car's been broken into, yeah? Guess what I'd do? I wouldn't go, oh no man, I'm tuning in with the universe, I feel great. I'd go, fucking bastards, because that's appropriate. That's an appropriate response, isn't it? And then I want to find the people and kill them. An appropriate <laughs> response. No, it's right. And I, I'm not going to lie. I, but because I'm in a generally good state most of the time, I'll deal with it that much better. I'll get over it that much quicker. That girl certainly wouldn't have got over the eating disorders and the trauma associated with it by keep talking about the past. Because it's not a resource. It's a useless resource. I might take that resource and give it to someone I don't like, you know what I mean? And put it in them via the anchors. But get that, so the first impression thing is quite important. I'm glad you brought it up. I mean, you know, when you meet someone for the first time, if you're in a good state and you allow them to access good states, you anchor that. So I never touch a client, never shake hands with a client until they go new. And that's the first meeting, isn't it? The, the, Matt and me, right, when we came in today, you never met us before, if we come in the kitchen, ignored you, yeah? And I came in here and went, uh, uh, we're here to, uh, done a bit of NLP. Um, I'm here to teach NLP. You would have all gone, oh, fuck, what a waste of money. You're probably still thinking that. But, <laughs> uh, but unconsciously, you know, it's a good thing. How's your name? Just covered it up. <laughs> ah, there it is. I asked for that. So I can see, you see. So if I see you slipping in a bad cell, I'll go like that, and then you'll double the feeling. It's good. It does work, though, doesn't it? Absolutely. It's good. Job looking at women's knees. Fantastic. <laughs> or even touching them in some cases. Ooh. <laughs> that wasn't directly you, Fiona, but it certainly was a good anchor, isn't it, for you? If I see you downtown ever again, I'll go, hello, oh, oh. and you'll go, oh. <laughs> Stop making me feel good for no good reason. <sighs> and don't wriggle in your chair. <laughs> it's a bit unnerving. So, anchors are powerful things. Know when you're putting them in, and realise that you can put bad anchors in as well as good anchors. You see someone at a funeral, don't start patting them on their back and touching them and, yeah? I was at a mate's funeral not too long ago and he was brilliant because he knew he was dying. He's only 41 and he's dying of cancer. And he got all the lads to wear t-shirts, right? He wrote it out in his will and everything. That when he died, he had his funeral at the Robin Hood last week, that we all wore t-shirts with, last man to die is a sissy. <laughs> right? That was Alan's approach to life. Yeah? What a brilliant anger. Because everybody's there smiling, even his dad, who was obviously, you know, grieving for the whole thing, still saw the funny side of it, which is brilliant, because when people remember Alan, they'll remember that and the way he was, rather than, oh God, he was terrible. Oh, a long illness, oh God. You know what I mean? So, they're all around us, anchors are everywhere, advertisers use them. Come on, you, you can all remember a time you sat in the car and you've heard, Music and you've gone, whoa, makes you feel good. Or music makes you feel, oh god, I remember he was beautiful, oh, he left me for a little bit. Not me, obviously, not my boyfriend. Just share something here with us, Bob. In one of those days. So, Matt, sorry to interject. No, that's fine. Yeah, you can get them doing an exercise, man. I am, yeah. And then we'll break for lunch. Sounds good to me. Because lunch is always a good anchor. Yeah, mm -hmm. lunch. Yeah, listen awesome. to my voice. Yeah, yeah. quick demonstration. Matt, close your eyes. Right. Okay. This is how you're going to do it. You're going to be as dramatic as possible. You can make a complete arsehole of yourself in the end. Nobody else can see. Yeah. 
apart from possibly the millions of people on my <laughs> <laughs> That put you on the spot. Okay, so you get them to close their eyes and you say, right, man, I want you to go back to me, tell me you felt fucking fantastic. Notice what I'm doing. I'm feeling good when I'm doing it. So you've got to be a bit of a bit of a bit of a drama queen, right? So go back to a time, close your eyes. Go back to a time when you felt absolutely fantastic, thinking about that particular time, seeing what you saw, hearing what you heard, and feeling what you felt at that time. Yeah, good, good. And then double that feeling, and double it again. Now as soon as I get a response out of them, see how I'm looking at them? I'm looking closely at what's going on. Yeah? Now do you get a picture with that? Yeah, how big's a picture on that? What's a big picture? Is it in colour or black and white? Colour. Colour. What's the colour? One to ten? Uh, eight. Eight. So it's a pretty bright colour. We'll leave it at that, yeah? Okay, the more you look at this picture, the more the feeling starts. Where do you notice the feeling starting that? Yeah. In the middle of your chest. Which way does it move? Out or round? Or or it goes out down the arms. Okay, as you feel it spread out around the arms, double the feeling, double the feeling, and start to increase the intensity by increasing the speed of the feeling. Double the feeling and double it again. In a moment, I'm going to touch on the shoulder, the right shoulder, okay? But only when it's a time that's appropriate for it to take effect, okay? So as you think about that particular time, seeing what you saw, hearing what you heard, feeling what you felt, double the feeling, double it again, then double it, that's right, breathe in. Notice, as soon as I notice a big change, I say, that's right. Mm -hmm. Affirm it to them. Tell them, that's right, good lad. Pat them on the back. You feel fucking fantastic. That's right, and then we double it again. Put a sound in as well, because that's good as well. Because <laughs> I can just walk up the match and go, whoa, what are you doing? <laughs> but you can, okay, there, like that. Okay, and relax, open your eyes. That's how long it should take, right? I've been doing it for a number of years, obviously, and struck off twice. But, uh, <laughs> okay, so you saw the physiological changes in your partner, you kept yourself in a heightened state, and then I just go, how's that feel? Mm -hmm. And of course, we're going to accept that, he's going to lie anyway, isn't he? Because we're doing the demo. <laughs> but this afternoon, you'll see how powerful it is because one of you is going to go, oh, I hate this person, but I actually love this person. Oh, on the other hand, I hate this person. But on the other hand, oh, I might like this person. And we're going to put the stuff together and you'll see what happens. You see what I'm doing? Get yourself in a good positive state. Make a fool of yourself in here. Because you're going to have to do it out of there. <laughs> Make people feel good for no reason. Okay? Right. Quick on with the exercise. Ten minutes apiece. And then we'll break for lunch. Thanks, my friend. So, uh, phobias. It's one of the uh, big things in NLP. Because NLP got quite famous by doing very, very fast phobia cures on people. Where they had issues and anxieties that would go for years and years and then they could do one hour with an NLP practitioner bang it's just gone and it's a very very misunderstood subject one of the things we were talking about before the break is uh, submodalities and the way in which we represent the world back to ourselves inside of our heads for example if I say to you I want you to think about your mother you might get a certain picture maybe a certain sound, the sound of her voice and a certain feeling will come up if I say to you think about the Big Brother show then you might think about that Geordie fella and the sound of it and that particular picture of the eye so these are various things that start to fire off, and that then becomes an anchor. Phobias uses all of these different things, and understanding phobia cures requires an understanding of submodalities and anchoring, and how we collapse anchors. I'm going to tell you a little story, and this story involves Mr. Spore. Uh, when um, me and Bob first went for our first NLP training, it was with Paul McKenna. How many years ago is that now? About 10, 10 years ago or more. Um, and I learned something pretty profound in one of the days there. I've had a fear of spiders since I was very, very young. Not big ones, the tiny, tiny little ones. Now here's something that you need to understand about, about phobias and internal representations. I work a lot in schools and I work a lot with school kids and I'm supposed to go in and teach them study skills. But once they understand that I know about psychology, inevitably I'll always get some 16 year old in one of the breaks will come over and say, can you show me how to pull more girls? And he'll be like, yeah, okay, what's the problem? And they'll always say the same thing, I'm really, really shy. You go, you're shy? Yeah, okay. Well, what happens when you think about going over and talking to a girl? Basically what happens, same thing every time, they run a video inside their head, and the video goes like this. They see the girl across the room they want to speak to, they think about going and speaking to her, everybody in the room stops talking, turns and looks at them, as they walk over to talk to her, she turns around and goes, Ugh. all of her friends go, ha, 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 and his trousers fall off. And they'll run that video three or four times really, really fast inside of his head. Phobia videos are always run fast. And I used to do this similar thing with spiders, and it's not cool, you know, I'm a big guy, and I'm a martial arts instructor, but a little spider comes in and goes, 
no. And people are like, what's wrong with you, Richie? That's a bit sad. And what would happen inside of my head? How many of you are afraid of spiders or have had an anxiety to do with spiders? Who's not afraid of spiders at all? Okay, here's the difference, right? People who are not afraid of spiders do this. They say, look, there's a little spider. How boring. And the spider's not interested in you at all, really, is it? And so you shouldn't be interested in it either. And it just sits there doing a spider business. I would do this. My phobia program would do this. See the little spider. It's busy, it's got things to do, it's got to pick the kids up after school. Doing its spider new business, and then it stops, and it can smell me. And it looks up, Richie Flesh, yum yum. And then I see it running towards me. Now it's actually this big, with the representation inside of my head, suddenly it's got massive eyes, big jaws, big hairy legs. And the man's inside, none of this is real, it just happens inside my head. I'm running away. Fall over, the spider catches me, runs up my trousers, that goes up my nose and lays eggs in my brain. By the time I've done that, I'm good and scared. None of it's real, but this is what I do. People always say to me things like to do phobia cures. Cure me of this phobia, cure me of that phobia. You never completely cure certain phobias. They're there for a reason. People get anxious in certain states. You should feel slight anxiety and a desire to be more externally focused and aware when driving a car, for example. People say to me, I'm scared of heights. Cure me of my fear of heights. You're not scared of heights. If I show you a picture of a tall building, you don't go, but it's a tall building! It's a fear of falling off. You have to run a video where you go, Bleh. Now, if I do that, that will make me afraid of heights as well, so I don't do it. Obviously, you never cure somebody's fear of heights. They might go up a tall building and jump off. I can fly! <laughs> which, of course, we all can, but not for very long. You only get one go. So, the way in which I approach phobias with people is a little bit different. And I learned this when uh, I was doing the NLP uh, practitioner course with, uh, with Paul McKenna and Bob. We were sat there, and we said, okay, we're going to do phobia cures. And they said to the group of us, put your hand up if you're scared of spiders. And I put my hand up like that, yes, I'm scared of spiders. And uh, they bring out this Steve Irwin looking guy with the khaki shorts and the shirt, and he has a box with holes in it. And I'm not very switched on, so I'm going, I wonder what's in the box. <laughs> Brings out a massive hand sized tarantula. He goes, what do you think of that? And I was sat there and I went, whoa, I feel a bit sweaty and anxious. <laughs> this is absolutely true. There's a woman three rows behind us, saw the tarantula, swore a big sweary word. Okay and just ran screaming out the door into a busy London road. She just ran. That's a phobia. What I had is just like a mild anxiety. What they did was very, very clever. They brought her into the room and it was an eyes open trance that they ran with her. And the spider was way over the other side of the room and they brought her inside the room she's like that. <sighs> and Paul, Paul McKenna's chatting away and he goes, okay, you're going to go over and uh, you're going to go and touch the spider in a moment. I'm going to let you touch the spider because he has that special radio DJ voice. You're going to go and touch the spider. And she's like, I'm probably not. I'm going to wall first. And I went, okay, okay, okay. You can't walk over there. No. And she was stiff. She was stiff and so pale. And they said, can you walk to there? And she went, I'll walk to there, but I'm not going any further. And very, very slowly, they started to build states of confidence, feeling good, and move her step by step through this process. 35 minutes later, she's up on stage, holding a tarantula, stroking it. Screaming phobia to stroking a tarantula, 35 minutes. And as I was watching it, what do you think happened to my phobia? It disappears. You're always listening, you're always learning, you can't help it. So as I'm sat there listening to phobia cure, just completely eradicated. And uh, they bring out this boa constrictor on stage and they're handling these things. And how they did it actually, the way in which you change, the way in which you eradicate phobias is just a change of perspective. It's what we call in NLP a reframe. And the thing that they did with her was actually very, very simple. And it's a very, very powerful reframe. Bob mentioned it before. You respect the client, and Matt's mentioned it as well. Respect the client, but you don't have to respect what's wrong with them. It can be funny, and it often is. You know, if you watch Richard Bandler work with clients, he'll just sit there and say, so what can I do for you? And he'll sit there, and as they're telling him, every time I see my uncle, I want to be sick, he'll just sit there and look at them and smile. If you try that with a client, it's amazingly powerful. That alone, you just sit there, and as they're telling you this ridiculous phobia they have, and you go, mm-hmm, they'll start to laugh as well. They can't help it. We get it wrong sometimes in counselling, we're like, oh, bless you. And then what? Then you have to cut yourself. Oh, that's terrible. If sympathy worked, if sympathy actually worked, all of our grandmothers would be highly paid psychiatrists. <laughs> have a cup of tea, love, and a little cake, you'll feel better. Doesn't work. Sense of humour. If you take it seriously, it locks the problem in place. When you have a sense of humour and you laugh about it, you start to have more options. NLP is all about giving people options. One choice, one response. If every time you see your uncle, you've got to go, bah! that's not freedom. Freedom is having lots of choices. 
And what they did was they installed the sense of humour by going, so you're going to go and see the spiders, Paul McCann with the girl who's walking across. The thing you should know about this spider, her name is Priscilla. She likes line dancing. When she goes line dancing, she wears little red cowboy boots on her feet. It's a lie. Priscilla does not do line dancing, but neither is it true that she's going to jump off the table and bite this woman on the eye. So if you're going to believe something that's stupid and not true, you may as well believe something that makes you laugh instead of something that scares the poop out of you. So I'm sat there next to Bob, and I'm like that with the spider and the snake, and I'm a bit wary, and I went, Bob, are you scared of the spider? And he's like that, no, are you? I said, come on, Bob, you must be. What about the snake? And he's like, nah. I said, I think you just trying to be a big tough soldier. I don't believe you. What's going on? And he said, no, what it is, when they did jungle training, they were trained to eat what was ever was available. And it wasn't a case of, all right, lads, if you run out of food, you can eat these snakes and spiders. They go, give us your rations, see you in three days. So you either eat the snake or the spider, or you don't eat. So he sees the spider, and he's thinking, tasty snack, and be spider curry like. <laughs> and I was like, that is the most disgusting thing I've ever heard. He's going, well, you can't be scared of something you snack on, can you? And I'm like, I suppose not. He said to me, have you ever been scared of a cheeseburger? And I'm going, I wish I was. Um, there was one time at Wimpy, but that's a different story. So you can have this reframe that I like to use, very, very powerful with any kind of phobia or anxiety, where you're the predator and it's the prey. So often in life we start to feel like we're the victim of situations. If you can change those sort of modalities, so instead of having this big scary spider appear, or your tax returns, or your credit card bills, whatever it might be, if instead they're down here, and as Bob said in the before, where it's in sequence, it's in range, I can do something about it. Just try it with anything that's getting you. Bring it down here. And then you become the predator. You're bigger than it. I do this with little kids when they're getting bullied. You know, rather than have the person in their head come over and go, give us your money, they come over and go, give us your money! And you know, shrink them down really small and then just boop them across the room. So that's one, another very powerful reframe, is the predator reframe. The most powerful one, I think, that I love the most, is the scientific reframe. This is where you look at the problem and you say, okay, what are we really talking about here? What, what, what's actually going on? And a girl, uh, she came to me and said, I'm scared of lifts, I can't get in lifts! And I was like, okay, that's weird, I had this really strange vision of lifts, and I was going, yes, they can be vicious sometimes. I imagined the lift chasing her down the corridor going, ah, 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 I was saying, what, you know, what is it you're really talking about here? What is it that's actually going on? Let's be scientific. Now, there is a master of the scientific reframe. Some of you will know if you watch uh, much TV and you like the uh, animal documentary channels, and I'm addicted to them personally. Do you ever watch Steve Irwin, The Crocodile Hunter? Mm -hmm. Steve Irwin, master of NLP, master communicator with himself. What does Steve Irwin say? If you think about his language patterns, they're very, very specific. Do you know what he says? Have you ever heard him say certain weird things? You notice how he'll go up to an elf, he says things like, crikey, you could die. But he'll go up to really, really dangerous animals. Have you noticed this? He'll say, isn't she beautiful? Isn't he amazing? He or she, it's never it. And it's always beautiful and amazing. He stays in that very, very scientific state of fascination. Fear and fascination don't exist side by side. When I was doing martial arts training with, uh, with Bob, he used a lot of psychology. And one of the things, the first things he taught me is fear and aggression can't sit in the same place. So we don't have to eradicate the fear, we replace it, we ignore it, replace it with it, aggression, determination, the will to move forward. Sometimes when you focus on the problem, you focus on the fear, you start to give it more power than it really deserves. You put in a replacement pattern, boom, all just fades away behind you, black and white disappears. Okay? So scientific reframe, obviously Steve Irwin's completely insane. I'm just convinced. Here's a man, walk up to a perfectly sound 14 foot crocodile, and it'll be like that. She's asleep right now. We've got to be really, really quiet. If we wake her up, she'll kill us all. Here's a nut who'll get his finger, stick it up her bum. Well, I see she's angry now. And you're like that. Yeah, you would be if you'd been woken up like that, Steve. I mean, to be fair, he says the reason why he is that's the only way to truly tell the gender of a reptile. Personally, I think the man's a pervert. Walking around the outback in his shorts, stroking the snakes. Hmm. But I learned something watching a show where the, uh, he was in the outback and he was saying the Australian white is the most poisonous snake in the world. If you bite it, you die inside of 15 minutes. I was like, wow, I didn't know that. They nest underground. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. So he's in his little truck and he sees this hole in the ground with rocks around it. He goes, oh look, there's a viper's nest. If I'd been there, it'd be like that. How interesting. Can we go back to the hotel now, please? Not Steve. Gets out of his truck, gets a shovel, digs the hole a bit wider so that he can get his head inside the viper's nest. He's in there with a handheld camera and a torch. He's going, this is amazing. The snakes are like that, next to his cheek. One bite from one of these little fellas, and I'd be dead. But it's all right, I'm a professional. And you're thinking, you'll be a dead professional. There's no coming back from that. But he's controlling the way he represents the experience to himself. So instead of going, oh, I'm going to die, 
time is actually going into the state of fascination that allows him to do different things. It's all about controlling states, state first. Whatever you do, whatever process you're gonna work with anybody, whether it's a phobia cure or timeline therapy, anything, your state counts. You have to feel good first. So you wanna draw somebody into a state, that's the state you need to go into first. That's your introduction to phobias. I'll hand you back over to Mr. Spewer. Well, thank you, brilliant. Turn your perception of an event. Once you've done that, it's obvious we'd use an anchor. Obviously you guys, as we mentioned earlier on today, can think of someone that creates a state in you that's not beneficial. Yeah, you may even be phobic of them, but certainly they give you anxiety, they make you feel bad when you think about them. I promise you that would look at a way of getting rid of this bad feeling and replace it, okay, so that when you think of that person, you no longer have bad associations, yeah? So do you have one? Yeah, there's quite, quite a few of you going. <laughs> do you know when you think of this person now, Fiona? Um, what happens? Do you get a bad feeling about them? Yeah, I just feel a bit panicky. Or a bit panicky? Yeah. Oh, so it would be good to get rid of that completely, wouldn't it? Do you want to do this little thing? Yeah. All right then. Okay, we'll just stay there. Yeah? Right, what we'll do, remember the, the techniques we talked about for um, putting anchors in, right? What I want to do, I want to put a good anchor on this leg mm -hmm. and a bad anchor on this leg. So I want you to think of the person that you really like. Someone that you really find fascinating, you love them, you like to see them, you like to hear them, yeah? And when you think about that person, do you get a picture in your head? Yeah. Yeah, how big's the picture? Quite big. Quite big. Well, show me with your hands. Yeah. Come on, we all make pictures, so nobody's embarrassed now. There's a big picture. Yeah. In colour? Yeah. Yeah? Can you see yourself in the picture? Or you're looking through your... You can see yourself. Okay, and you're with that person. Yeah. And when you think about that person now, it makes you feel good. Okay, close your eyes. We'll do this professionally. <laughs> right. You can... You don't mind me touching your knees? No. no okay, right. So think about that person, seeing what you see, hearing what you would hear, and feeling what you would feel as if you were with that person now, yeah? The more you think about that person, the more the good feelings start to generate in your body. Can you feel them? Whereabouts do they move? Show me if you want to be your hands. Yeah. All the feelings out there? Yeah. Ooh, do you want the feeling put inside of you? <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> it's I thought a... you said there you No, 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 sorry, the feeling. <laughs> Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Where's the feeling? In there. Yeah, I was going to say, feelings outside the body. We're all bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody else will have them. <laughs> you, you've got to have them. So can you feel it? When you think about that person now, it makes you feel good. Yeah. Double the feeling and then double it again. And then double it again. Oh, I'm going to put them on this knee, yeah? we we'll put them on that knee there. Yeah? So whenever I touch this, this finger touches your knee here, you get that good feeling. Yeah? Okay. Relax. Open your eyes. Okay. So, we all learned how to do that. Yeah? And I'm doing a very physical anchor here to demonstrate. So all I've got to do is that, and there it, it comes back. So we test it. Okay, now what I want to do is, we want to think about this person you don't like. Okay. We're going to keep this as short as possible because it's a panic you're feeling. And we want to get rid of that as soon as possible, yeah? It's a good thing, wouldn't it? So that when you see this person next, you're going to see them and just go, what was I bothered about? That's what you'd like. Or maybe you even see them with a condom on their nose and their pants around their ankles, you know, a toilet paper hanging out the back of the, I don't know, whatever, yeah? Okay. Okay, so think about that person now. Close your eyes, that's right, Fiona. And as you listen to the sound of my voice, I want you to see what you would see, hear what you would hear, feel how you would feel as if you were with that person now, or seeing that person now. And it's not a good feeling. No, it's not a good feeling at all. Okay? But I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it very quickly. I'm going to anchor it on this knee here. So that whenever I touch this knee here, you're going to think about that person and it makes you feel that's right. Yeah, but we're not going to leave it for too long. Okay, open your eyes. Right, so, how's this one? Ah, <laughs> okay, that worked, didn't it? Right? Yeah, what about that one? Yeah. Comes back. Yeah, it's horrible, isn't it? So, you watch her, don't watch me, yeah? So watch Fiona. So there's a good one. There's a bad one. You're filming it, can't you? Yeah, it's a horrible feeling. What happens when I do that? Oh, oh shit. What's happened? How weird is that? I feel good again. Well, yeah, I would think so, because you know what? The unconscious always picks, if it's got a choice, it picks the good stuff. So of course, you can think about that person, it still feel good. Yeah, what happens when you think about this person? It good again. Oh, all right. Are you thinking about, come on, try and get the bad feelings back. Try and get them back. <laughs> Make it that good. Heads. Think about this person now. No, I don't feel like When are you going to see them next? Um, on Monday. On Monday. So you're going to, is it at work? Yes. So you go to work, you see them on Monday. Imagine you're going into work now. What happens when you see them? 
On a scale of one? Absolutely. Honestly? Yeah, I don't feel anything. Well, that's the quickest one I've ever done. Really? Yeah, honestly. That one's still there, isn't it? Yeah. Bad one? I actually feel nothing. It's not like I feel Brilliant. good, I just feel nothing. Thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks really Collapse and anchors works quickly, but normally people go, mm, yeah, I still have a little bit I don't like about them, so I have to get rid of it. That was, what, a minute? About a minute phobia cure, that. <laughs> yeah, a minute phobia. I've done a phobia cure in three minutes. <coughs> really? Yeah, in here. <coughs> it's bizarre. Um, so yeah, powerful output. Now I haven't set this up. This is not set up. This, you know, today is the first time I've met Fiona. But that shows you how it is. So think about that person, you see? You can all ask her. Yeah, no, I don't. Look, I, I, there's I, no response, is there? I feel absolutely nothing towards them at all. Brilliant. And that's the way you want to film. Because the way you looked before was like panic and anxiety. You said it. Would they fit in now with your worldview? Your perception of that person then? I didn't care what they did. <laughs> now that's useful, you see? Now it might only seem like a little thing, but feeling I could have lived the rest of my life, I work in life, having to face up to this person every day and feel shit, which doesn't do you any good. It's not good for your health. So in a minute, it's all, you're all capable of doing this now. There's no magic here. You know, I've got special powers. Yeah? It's just simple procedures that you can follow to change someone's perception using anchors. This is how powerful anchors are. I'm glad that's worked out as quick as that. Because that just shows me how powerful anchors are. Yeah? Mm. And you can do that with any. I mean, uh, I've had people with um, things about anger, issues around anger. You know, so I put good stuff on this knee, anger reactions on this knee. You want to collapse that anger reaction in a specific situation? Bang. Let's work it. Because as Richard was saying, that's how phobias work through anchoring. And then changing your perception. I've changed your perceptions about that person now. Eh? You have a totally different approach. Now, if you can do that with that, you can do it with anything. Because all of these things can be generalized. Motivation can be generalized. We just don't feel it can be. Isn't that true? We think, well, I can get motivated to do this, but I can't put the bin bags out on a Monday morning. It's right, isn't it? That's what I used to have problems with. I could storm an embassy. I could run across the Falklands. I can get shot at. And blow things up, jump out of helicopters. I love doing it. And then put the whole... Have you all been motivated to do things? Yeah, yeah. Would you like to be able to move that motivation into another area of your life? Yeah. Yeah, of course you would. If you said no, I'd be going, oh, all right. <laughs> yeah, can I get motivated? Another day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I suppose so. Confidence is another behaviour that people go on about. They always say, ooh, I want more confidence. But I, I can't think of a time when I've been really confident. And I always say to them, oh, are you sure about that? They go, absolutely. They go, ha ha, caught you. I'm so confident that I haven't got confidence, I'm confident. And it would be nice to be able to move that confidence from that situation into another area of your life. Um, the nicest one I use for motivation, I've used it with a few clients. They'll sit and tell you, clients are like this, they want to screw things up for you right from the start. They'll say, I can never remember a time when I was totally motivated. It just doesn't come into my head. I cannot think of a time when I was motivated. I say, right, okay. Um, have you ever been down 10 or have you ever sat in a car absolutely busting to go to the toilet and you need to find a loo? Everybody goes, oh, well, yeah. Can you all think of a time when you've gone home? How much motivation goes through your body? <laughs> ah, now I've got to find a toilet. Psh, no, I've got to find a toilet. Yeah? You find a public convenience. You will jump out of the car and stand on the hard shoulder and go, ah, I don't care anymore. Well, obviously, if you've got one of them. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, no. Okay. Um, yeah? If you could have that level of motivation, you know, there is your life, how much would you get done? Yeah, lots. You would get masses of stuff done. Okay? This is why, like, Matt, myself, and no doubt Richard, yeah, we do as many things as we can. We've got loads of time. And it's like, brilliant, what am I going to do today? I mean, I saw his receipt earlier on, harmonica. And he goes, yeah, I'm playing harmonica now. Go, oh, brilliant. <laughs> what do you do next week? Oh, I'm making a motion capture game. <laughs> oh, right, all right. And I'm teaching social workers in Cardiff on Thursday, and I'm, I'm doing a site visit in Guildford on Wednesday. And cool. You know what my friends say? Oh, oh you're wasting your time. No, I don't want to be doing all that. So what do you do with your life then? Oh. 
work and then go home on a play squash once a week. Great life, yeah. You know? No, oh, but we don't feel like getting motivated. We can all do with more motivation. Right? I mean, when we do the NLP course, we always say, tell you what, why don't we start with the idea that will get you motivated and confident that you're going to be the best NLP practitioners in the world. Way! That's a good thing, isn't it? Okay, so the exercise we're going to do on motivation, we'll move to some modalities. Yeah? The exercise we're going to do on motivation is, let's get you motivated to be the best NLP in reduction practitioner. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah? No. You know, you want to learn stuff today really quickly. And be able to go away and be confident about using it. Or motivated to do it. Yeah, let's pick, pick that particular skill, right? Now, can you all think of times in the past when you've been totally motivated? Yeah. Are you sure? This, this usually indicates a really good, yeah. Everybody? Yeah? Something you do really well, you enjoy doing it. You might be like passing your driving test. Wow! You wanted to do it, you passed it, it's a fantastic feeling. Positive response, yeah? Right. And the way we do it is very simple. In your manuals, they've got them in the manuals. Yeah, it should be. Yeah? I think it's page 15, but. I've got the page 15. They'll say a little chart. I've got some better Right? Right. When people bring problems to you in NLP, we always talk about the positive aspects of their experiences. Like with that girl, I didn't go into the bad stuff. I didn't say talk about why she cuts herself. I'm not interested in why she cut herself. I'm not interested in why she has an eating disorder. That doesn't interest me at all. I'm interested in how she does things. This is the difference between NLP therapy and traditional psychotherapy. Yeah? Traditional psychiatry, traditional psychotherapy, will spend most of its time talking to the client, gathering information about why they've got the way they've gone. What will that tell us? Nothing. Except to teach the therapist how to do what they've done. Oh, all right, okay, so I need to get abused. Yeah, and then have this response. Okay, I'm not interested in why. You know when I switch that light bulb on today? I'm not interested in why it works. I want to know, how, how do I make light in here? Click that. Oh, there. Oh, there. Hey. We have light. It might be interesting at a later date to understand why it works. Just out of fun. You know, when I was set in the jungles, nobody said to me, well, this is why we're going to do this. No, they say, look, look, lads, this is how you do it. This is how you kill someone. This is how you set up an ambush. This is how you skin a snake. This is how you prepare it needed. So I was brought up with practical demonstrations. So, how you do motivation can be broken down into specific areas, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and you'll see them on the list there. You see, because in NLP, because we look at how, we need to know what the structure is of motivation. When someone says, I'm happy, I don't ask them why, I say, well, how do you do happiness then? What do you mean how? I say, well, how do you do it? What do you see? What do you hear? What do you feel? This is the structure of our experience. Now remember what we said about maps, right at the beginning of the day. You all have maps of the world. When you all walked into this place today, it's one big territory, but you all have different maps in your head of how it's gonna turn out today, of where you're gonna go, what you're gonna do, what is the room gonna look like, what are the trainers gonna be like? Yeah, they're all distinctly different. How you do that is based on your, your senses, the information you gather, and we'll do it differently, we know that now. Okay?